sugar, no cream, straight talk with Valerie Black, strong and unfiltered. And tonight, we have another episode of the High Low Podcast. Say what's happening. What's up? What's up? All right. So we have Kaya and Tyler. So Tyler, what's our current event topic for the day? Um. Well, I think two weeks ago, right? The Astroworld incident with Travis Scott. I think it was two weeks ago. And um, did you hear about it? No, I did not. So. Um. So Astroworld is basically a Travis Scott concert. He's a rapper. And it was for a capacity. It's basically a festival that happens every year. And it was about 50,000 people there. And due to heat exhaustion and um, over capacity, because beforehand, before the show started, about like three to 5,000 people broke in to get into the concert. And it, they just let it happen. And they didn't have any tickets. They just yeah. stormed yeah. the place. Yeah, they just stormed the place. But it was supported by Travis on social media telling them to like keep on going so it was just like the capacity was overfilled and due to that people started to uh have uh heart palpitations and have strokes and over 10 people He's probably died gonna be sued for that and that's the thing um 10 people died um the youngest is a 10 year old and people are now asking um who's to blame who should be held accountable and people are saying that um, him, because he supports the raging and everything like that, but other people then says the venue should also be held accountable because with holding a venue, you should also have um, doctors, EMTs, or people on standby, excuse me, on standby to like be ready, you know, for anything to happen. And they were there, there were EMTs, but when there was videos out, they showed them not prepared there was one video of them dropping somebody that was unconscious unconscious and stuff so the question just is who's supposed to be held accountable well you know when it comes to litigation um whoever has the most money and the best attorney is probably gonna to win but if you're asking me just from personal opinion um i believe the venue should have had some form of crowd control you know, whether that's security or scanning tickets or whatever. But if he was the hype man and telling people to really break the law and having people come in, then um, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see. But he can say a lot of things, right? We have all types of um, influencers and people in the media or whatever but they shouldn't be in control of another adult's behavior so it don't matter what he said if he said go run play in traffic would they go just get hit by a car you know on exactly. the freeway so yeah. I don't know if I could say Travis Scott should be responsible for the behavior of those individuals it's going to be hard to find each one of those individuals and charge them or um, have them even admit to their guilt so it's just going to be an interesting situation. I'm sorry that someone had to lose their life as a result of that, though. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. Um, and you said the youngest was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's reprehensible. What do you think, Kaya? Um, I stand where I think. I think everybody who was involved is at fault, but I don't think Travis is solely to blame. I think as a business person, that's probably where he would be more liable except like, instead of the artist perspective of it. Cause I feel like there was a lot of things they could have done to prevent it. Like, I believe they said that the police chief came to Travis before the show and was like, we think this is gonna be like a mass, mass casualty event. And they still decided to go on with it. I just think there was a lot of missteps by the venue promoters and everybody involved. I would say right now that um, Travis Scott House put out a thing saying that uh, he's giving refunds back to um, all the people that has purchased the tickets for Astroworld. So they are getting some type of refund. But I then also saw an article where um, if you do get the refund, you then aren't able to sue. <laughs> well... Which is like, I mean, that makes sense because, but it's just like, is it though? 
but um well we have a viewer miss greenpeace jones says do you believe it should be a, a class action lawsuit in all fairness and, and i say yes you know that's what it's going to end up being actually some attorney is going to get wind of this and reach out to some of the litigants and say hey you know, but at the end of the day, they're not going to get a whole lot. Um, I think it's more principle than anything to establish some rules and to um, come up with more policies and procedures to be able to contain something like this in the future. It's probably the best they're going to get. But the person, the child that died, yeah. I think um, if anyone... And the other nine people. Got it. Nine people died? Ten people. Ten people all together, but the youngest was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So out of that, pain and suffering and damages that go along with their family. But, you know, it takes me into another subject that probably takes us off task. But if they were black kids, they don't value our lives. The youngest one was, yeah, black. was black. So the amount of money that they might even want to pay out, you know what I'm saying? It's just a lot of factors. So I won't peel the onion back, but I hope that something happens because i couldn't imagine anyone i know and love going to a concert and then i never see them again because someone stormed the venue regardless who said it so all righty next topic oh well the next topic is on aggression so the first topic that we want to discuss on aggression is like ways on handling them because over time, I realized that I feel like people these days don't know where to put their anger towards. I mean, they do. They put it towards each other. But it's like, what is the best way on instead of hurting each other, we like, I don't know, like do something or have a tool or a place where you can take out all of your anger and, and not be harming anything or being a negative intent. You know what I'm saying? Um. I do, and aggression comes from a very deep emotional place. Mm -hmm. um, aggression comes from a place that needs healing, that needs some love, affection, some understanding. It comes from a place of being tired and being misunderstood. There are so many variables to that. That person is almost walking around like a human hand grenade. We can use road, way, road rage as an example. Mm -hmm. They're blowing a the horn and giving you the bird and everything else. When you just made a mistake, everyone knows there's a blind spot when you're driving. Everybody knows that. And you just happen to be in that person's blind spot and you get the business. That's because they were already full of aggression when they got behind the wheel. So all of the reasoning and rational thinking kind of goes out of the way when you're full of anger and aggression. You're dealing with the emotions and not your intelligence at the time. So I think people are moved by emotion and not intelligence most of the time. Mm -hmm. We should be trying to move according to rational thinking than emotion and how we feel, but that's not how it works, especially in the spur of the moment. So I guess the thing is, how do you handle it? Yeah, because I know for me, it's like when I'm angry, I have nowhere to put it. So I just sit there and just like fester in it basically until it goes away. And I know that's not good. And that's one of the other questions I want to ask, which is like, does suppressing your anger get you nowhere basically? Like, does it just cause you to be in the cycle of just being mad forever? Or do you like, is there a easier way on just like letting it out without, you know, doing something I feel rash? Like you can channel like, if you do it in a healthy way, I feel like you can channel it into being something beautiful. Mm -hmm. But if, I don't know. I feel like it's all in how you take it. Like, you could try breathing exercises, meditate, just try to, because I do relate to you when I say that you just fester in it. Mm -hmm. But I do, do think that there's a human response in 
just letting yourself feel things because a lot of times we let us we like to suppress the anger and not fully just be angry for a minute and i feel like that comes with it as well you know i wonder is like due to like i don't know because i know there's some things that help with anger i know there's a rage room in canton that's like you pay sixty dollars and like you get to uh and you get bust the walls with a sledgehammer they get you all you get to make your own playlist and you get for i think an hour i believe i think think an hour and you get to just break break stuff for a whole hour and i want to do it but the thing is it's sixty dollars and for anybody in whoever tax bracket it is a pricey where you stand at so it's just like what are things that maybe people can do where they don't have to pay $60? What is something that maybe you don't even have to leave your home? What is something that you can easily just like, if you have nowhere else to go, like sit in your room and maybe something to do to like calm down with that anger. And I'll say meditate, but. Meditation works, you know, aromatherapy. Interesting enough that we're talking about this because I was reading an article today about tapping. Have you heard of tapping? Mm -mm. Like taking your two fingers and just tapping in your middle of your forehead, on the side of your temple and here, and just tapping like with your eyes closed. And it signals some type of calmness in your brain. But I just be done knock the hell out of myself. <laughs> I'll be punching myself. I'm always upset at him all day. <laughs> just Woody Woodpecker and a, upside my head. But I did read that, and it was talking about how a school instituted that as part of behavioral management for some of the students, and it seemed to have done something. What I have learned to do, and I am still perfecting it, I'm not great at it, but I will say I am good at putting boundaries in place for Mm -hmm. myself. Because Mm -hmm. I am notorious for saying I don't want anybody controlling me and controlling my life, but they are controlling you if they get you to that point of aggression where you no longer have control of your own emotions. You are being controlled by something or someone else. So I have created like a buffer zone because for many years of my life, I knew what ticked me off, but I didn't know what made me tick. So I had to realize what makes me angry Mm -hmm. um, and what do I need to address and what simply is nonsense and I don't have to pay any attention to it. And when I started to categorize the things that are my irritants in my life, I've became more um, clear on what mattered and what didn't Mm -hmm. because that's what it boils down to at the end of the day, what matters and what doesn't and things that matter, even still, you can't control the actions of anyone else. So you have to learn to do what's best for you. What I, I learned the lesson best when my husband was dying because I was, somewhat everything to everybody in my family unit and solving other people's issues through my agency and then being the matriarch in my family and trying to help everyone, which I'm not complaining. I don't mind. Mm -hmm. You know, that's part of my purpose on this earth. But when my husband was dying, I had to decide what was really important. And at that time, I had to shift all of my priorities and everything because I only had time for what was a priority and what was important. And that filtered a lot of nonsense and BS out of my life. I still find myself reverting back to the more free lifestyle and allowing all of this stuff in. And then I have to center myself and say, nope, if today was my last day on earth, what would I care about? Mm. And it's not all of that stuff, right? So that's what I think about. How important is it? What impact does it have? Does it impact my livelihood, where I lay my head at night, you know, where my money comes from and things of that nature? Then I have to heavily consider that because it has a direct impact on my livelihood and how I'm living. Then I have to say, you know, um, Will the person even understand where I'm coming from if I bring it up? That's my Mm -hmm. thing. (laughs) 
And if it's a no, then you have to get to the point where you don't let it affect you. And that's the hard part. Yeah. Because you're a human being. Mm-hmm. I'm learning how to like build like a stone wall where like, or just something where I just have a foundation where nothing can affect me but me. And like, or I decide to let it affect me, like have it that down where it's like, I choose to let this affect me. But right now it's like, I let, I have everything affecting me and I don't know what to do about it, but to be angry. And then it's this like, okay, I know I'm angry and I understand that I'm being triggered by things that make me angry. And I understand that meditate maybe or journaling, but it's just like, <laughs> I I want <laughs> the internal is so big that I need to physically do something to get it out. Like the just letting everything just spin is basically how I feel is just doing. And I need it to just like dissolve basically like a sink and just let it run. But it's just trying to find you know things. Well see that's yeah. the thing. Because if I don't you... want to play sixty dollars every week. Or every day <laughs> to go break some stuff to not be angry anymore. I want to do something where it's free and I can just step away from somewhere for like maybe 30 minutes and just, you know. However, I think just going there to begin the release may not be a bad idea. You know, um, some people go to therapy, some people get high, some people drink, mm. some people punch the wall. You know, there's mm. all different ways that people get relief. And I know that paying money to get it is not ideal, but we have so many things at our disposal to use. We should probably not discount those things. You know, maybe it's a matter of you just getting a, a sledgehammer and a tree trunk and a brick in your backyard and just go out there and boom just honestly you know what yeah you know get your own <laughs> sledgehammer and a piece of concrete and just go in the back or chop some wood your mom has a fireplace i'm sure she wouldn't mind a whole bunch of chop wood <laughs> <laughs> go back there and chop it and chop you know but sometimes we can emulate those things too you know i at night lay in my bed and play a game i like play a card game on my tablet, something relaxing, mm. listening to terrain. You know, there's a myriad of things. However, the best form of this is not to get rid of it when it's there, is to stop it before it starts. And then that goes with your thinking, mm -hmm. right? Stop. And, and I'm not going to say, oh, you can do that for everything. You cannot. We are emotional beings. We have emotions and they're going to get off balance. That's why we can laugh and we can cry. But the thing is, just don't make them like be that high low. You want that balance. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you hit that low, you got to bring yourself up. And that's the key. Nobody else is going to do that. You know, um, I believe we get a lot of things that are filler conversations to make us feel better. You know, um, like people say, oh, God is going to fix it. And, you know, all of these other things be strong and all of these mm -hmm. other things that make totally no sense. Like you don't even have to say nothing because that's not working. What it is that you're saying, because no one walks in anybody else's shoes. I've never seen anyone outside of a Tyler Perry movie jump in a grave <laughs> at a funeral. I've never seen that. Same. Right? Yeah. So you, you do have to do what's best for you. And one thing that Thomas said, this is my disease. I'm the one dying. Don't let it kill you. I learned so much of about myself and so much about emotions when my grandmother died and then directly after he was sick enough to die. And going through that period, that's how I could stand so strong and valiantly. I thought it was going to break me, you know, those back-to-back mm -hmm. -back deaths of people who were my life. You know, but it did not because the gems that he was planting in me just made so much sense. Do what's best for you. This is my disease. Don't let it kill you. Our marriage and how we live is defined by us not society or anyone else. 
you know, and all of these other things. And I, those became my mantras. Like he's right. How I live my life. It's up to me. Nobody else has to like it, understand it or agree with it. We want someone to like it. We want someone to understand it and we want someone to agree with it. The problem is we get so down and out when they don't. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if they don't do those three things, at least they can respect how you feel. They don't have to understand your position. They don't have to like your position. They don't have to agree with it, but everybody deserves respect, even little kids. Respect where they are, meet them where they are, not where you expect them to be. And I think we would be a lot better off if we learned to do that. And sometimes you have to leave people where they are too, and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> You can leave them right where they are. It's okay. But I want our listeners to know, and I want you to know, it's okay not to be okay. It's not an abnormal thing or whatever. It's a way of life. Life is a battle every single day to live it. Nobody has an easy life. You can be a multimillionaire and you still got some issues. It's about having peace of mind mm -hmm. and whatever it takes to have that if that's blocking out people places things that's what it is and if you need to communicate you know like I need a minute sometimes I have to tell myself that with my nephew like could you just hold on because I never want him to feel how I used to feel as a kid like how I felt and what I was thinking wasn't important Mm -hmm. So I catch myself a lot saying, well, if you can just give me a second and I'll be right with you instead of like, don't you see I'm doing something? Totally different response. Don't you see I'm doing something shuts him down, stops him from wanting to approach me, makes what he's feeling and how he's feeling and what he wants to do in that moment irrelevant. Eventually he's just going to stop coming to me if that's what I'm saying. Right. So I'm like, hey, I'm in the middle of something. I'm busy. If you just give me a minute and I'll talk to you. And I truly do take the time to listen to him. I think when we start that very young, it builds a different type of person when we get older. Mm -hmm. We have been taught to harbor feelings over time by just not feeling comfortable expressing ourselves at very early ages because it's almost taboo. You're supposed yeah. to just go along with it. And a lot of times you just decide it's not worth it. Okay, I'm not going to say anything. And then, you know, our parents or parents come back and say, well, why didn't you say something? Not realizing that they could have said you talk, you can talk to me about anything, but that, environment has to be cultivated mm -hmm. i've had some clients where the parents will say well they can tell me anything and then when they tell you it's consequences or you just fall out like oh lord you know or whatever <laughs> and so when a kid sees that response or an adult or anyone sees that type of response it affects how they move after that yeah 100 right it, it affects what you say or do after that so a lot of us say um go ahead and tell me i can handle it as a cliche statement they really can't handle it mm -hmm. and so we have to be sure of that as well so it's a lot healing is a lifelong process it's an ongoing process maintaining your maintaining your peace is a lifelong process and an ongoing process. There is no one remedy because different situations in life are going to impact you a different way. But what I will say is every time you had that situation, release, release. Because if you don't, that's when it's a heavy load on you. Because you're like, oh, this happened, now this happened, now this happened, now this happened. And it seems like the whole world is caving in on you, right? Mm. So at that point, you need the release from the aggression. What do you think? Um, I think that's very true. I find myself, as I grow older, I feel like I have to express certain, certain emotions because if I don't, they just kind of 
continue to go throughout my day, week, month, or a year sometimes. And it's not it's not easy because sometimes you you got to put a smile on your face and care about your day sometimes and that's not what you want to do at the moment and it's so much easier said than done and it's like I mean cuz you want it to be so easy you just want to wake up and be like this I'm going to have a good day today mm -hmm. then that one thing happens and you're like this oh crap I don't even want to go anywhere it's mm -hmm. just like I feel like it's just, like you said, it depends on each person and how they find that thing to release their energy. Whether it's like playing video games, watching TV shows, or just sitting there in a quiet room, just thinking. I mean, I feel like it's all dependent on who it is. It does. It depends on who it is, the influence that they have over you you know, and things of that nature. I just did a show last week called Black Man Heal. And I invited um, Amp Uda Dan on. He's a rapper from Inkster that was expected to deliver from a little boy. You know, everybody was dependent on him. Even when he was hustling, you know, in the streets or whatever, people came to him. He felt like he had to deliver. And he was like, that was a lot of pressure. You know, but what it took f was for him to get hit by a semi-truck when he was on his motorcycle and could have died. And that's when he started having anxiety and depression and all these other things. So he said he went to the clinic and uh, the doctor just wanted to give him a pill and then another visit. And he was like, hold on, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to just be a pill head. Mm -hmm. Like, wait a minute, I don't mind taking this, but I need something more than this. You just want yeah. me to be high all the time or you know what's going on? This is not enough. So he just said he started rapping with the doctor and the doctor was like, wow, you really influenced my life. Yeah, because now he made that physician, that therapist, that psychologist take the time to really get to know me and what I'm dealing with. Now you can recommend some other things. But if you don't know me mm -hmm. and what I'm really dealing with, then you're just numbing the situation. And I'm not against medication, medication at all. Mm -hmm. I have anxiety and I take medication. But what I am saying is that is only a crutch. I need to learn how to deal with myself, what I was feeling, all of my emotions, what's going on in my life. What do I want in my life? What can I do without in my life? You know, just a myriad of things going on. How to deal with people. Understanding that people love me, but they are not capable of loving me the way that I need it. That one. was the most difficult because I had expectations from people who had certain roles in my life. I expected certain things. And when I didn't get them, it was very frustrating. So now I say, I know that I am loved and it's okay if I'm not loved the way that I need it. And that's what I have to understand and wrap my mind around. You love me, but you don't love me the way that I need it. But it's okay. The next question after that would be, well, what do you need? <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. then I've had to have that conversation. And it's okay if a person is not capable of delivering it. At least you will be able to divulge what it is because a lot of people may feel like they're doing their best and their best isn't enough and it may seem that way but that's not what this is i'm not saying that i'm not appreciative of the things that have been done and i'm not saying it's not enough to make you feel bad but what i would be saying is it's not what i need I'm not trying to quantify or whatever, but I need something different. And this is what I need. A lot of times we won't bear all because we're afraid of how we make other people feel too. Like, well, I don't want nobody to feel how I'm feeling. So I'm just not going to say that. Yeah. But it's like, no, I mean, you don't want to be abusive or, you know, <laughs> anything to anybody, a, a verbal <laughs> tongue lashing. But I think yeah. it is okay to be able to have an environment where you can openly share. 
the problem with that is um, everybody gets in their feelings because we're talking about feelings. So people are going to feel some type of way. But I would hate to not have these conversations and then relationships that should matter and do matter get to a point where they're beyond repair. Yeah. That is a huge issue. So let's take a quick musical break. And when we come back, we will continue to talk to Kaya and Tyler of the High Low Broadcast. You are listening to The Real Black Coffee, No Sugar, No Cream on 107.5 HD and 88.1 FM. We will be right back. Trisha Duckworth and that was the perfect song for this show about aggression and anger because we want to let it go but we need to figure out how to let it go during the break we were talking about where does it come from does the trauma and aggression go through generations and actually I will answer that question by saying a yes when a child is inside of the mother's room and the development of the central nervous system takes place, it affects the child also. That synaptic nerve system development affects the child also. And so a child is predisposed to certain things by how that mother's pregnancy was as well. Not just DNA, eye color, hair, and all of that, but actually the experiences of that mother. Oh, wow. And so um, I'll give you an example. I was born in 1964 in the middle of the civil rights movement in Alabama. I walked in somewhere in my daddy and came out in my mama. And nine months later, I was here on this earth. When my mother told me stories about how she grew up drinking out of the uh, water fountain that's na labeled black only, being a teen mother already dealing with racism and being a black woman in Alabama, now uh, ostracized because she's a teen mother and being pregnant. How am I going to provide for this child? Do I want my child to grow up with the same type of life that I have here? How am I going to make life better? My mother learned to shoot a gun at five years old 
and uh, would slap the taste out of your mouth. I went to one of her class reunions, and they was like, my mother was a fighter. And her and her siblings and cousins formed the Odina gang because they had to travel in gangs and packs to make sure that they weren't lynched or other things was happening. So they learned how to fight back. And look at what I'm doing today. I fight back. I take a stand and all of that stuff was happening when I was inside of my mother. But guess what else? I'm sure she had a lot of anxiety, not knowing if she was going to live or die every day, just going to school. And what do I have as a mental health condition? Anxiety. But I like how you made it into a positive thing and a negative thing. It's you get both. You don't get just the negative mm -hmm. thing. Cause I think when people hear trauma, they just think you're just going to have something that's very negative and, you know, I just appreciated the way that she's with it. Well, you know, <laughs> life didn't give me lemons, so I ain't make no damn lemonade. It <laughs> gave me anxiety, a love for drinking wine, how to survive on this earth. You know, it, it gave, life gave me a lot of things. So people say, oh, life give you lemons, make lemonade. No, I don't even know where they got that from. You're not making no lemonade out of no lemons. You know, not at all. Time doesn't heal our pain. Time ticks. Healing has to take place when you take a stand and do something about it. And we were talking about boundaries also during the break. And how do I set them? Because I have to look at how do I feel when I'm in certain environments? How do I feel when I'm around certain people? How do I feel when I talk about certain things? And then I stop doing those things. I don't want to talk about that at this moment. I'm not being rude or disrespectful. I don't want to talk about it. You know, um, I'm not going over to the family barbecue because I don't have enough willpower to make it through all of the questioning that's going to take place. A lot of places you've been, you already, let me say this, your trauma and your drama and aggression didn't come from people that you don't know. You don't even yeah. care about those people because yeah. you don't damn know them no way. They can't even get to you to that degree. It's people that you know, people that you have been around. So if you know what happens when you're around those people for so long, or you know the things that they say and do, you try to avoid them as much as possible. And if you cannot avoid them, you know when your blood is starting to boil a little bit. So you just pull back. Don't let yourself go there. And even when asked, if you feel like you're right there, you know, like, uh, I don't have the energy to talk about that right now. I'll get back with you. Don't say, oh, you can come to me later. No, I'll get back with you. That means when I'm ready to really talk about this, I'll come. Mm -hmm. I might not never get ready. Right? But at least the onus is saying, hey, when I feel like I want to talk about this, I can. Now, the problem becomes... Going back to who you normally were in your normal demeanor, even though you feel some type of way. I say don't mask it. You can bear your feelings, but people don't have to take the brunt of your aggression. But then it's like, how do you do that? Because I understand that means like don't take your anger out of them or something like that. But it's just, if you're trying to let yourself feel, how can you feel? <laughs> it's like, people are around but it's like I'm trying to keep my space and be alone but it's like people still come this way so it's like a you because know what I'm I think to say? communication is key I I think um and I do this a lot at home like, hey, you know, I need some time to myself. I'm going in the room. Give me about an hour, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Because if you don't explain, and I'm not saying fully explain every emotion and how you're feeling, but I am saying let someone know kind of what's going on and that you're about to isolate yourself for a while. Because if not, they are going to come. Mm -hmm. And they are going to. It might seem like prying. It's not prying. They care. And they want to know, like, why are you in your room with the light on? That's a good way of saying it. You yeah. know, or whatever. So I think... Open communication. Like, hey, this is not personal. I have anything to do with you. If it does, don't say that. Mm. You know, but you can just say, you know what? I'm all right. I'm just going in my room for a little while. I, you know, I just need to chill and relax and have some time to myself. And a good question to ask then is, I mean, I guess it's a simple answer, but I want to see what she was going to say. Is, or both of y'all, is what happened if um, a person 
hears you, but they like they still take it as like they did something wrong. So it's like they think you're blaming them for why you know, they try to like flip it, you know, to make them feel like the victim, basically. So how would you like go about that? I know for me I'll just say F off and go about my day, but what is a healthier way? I guess to do Well, first of all, sometimes it is difficult for people to take ownership of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially if they don't agree with what they should own. It's like, mm, no, I didn't say that. No, I didn't do that. No, I didn't mean that or whatever. It's very difficult for you to do that. And you can't control other people. So all you can do is say what you say, how you feel about it and mean it in the most compassionate way that you can. Cause snapping is different. That's why I'm saying that boundary is, you know, when you get ready to snap. Mm -hmm. So bring it on down. That's where the boundary is right there. And then at a level that you can still talk about it without going off. And then to say, you know, I, I'm sorry that you feel responsible or whatever, but this is just how I feel. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times I, um, answer questions with questions and I don't mean to be rhetorical, but it's like, that, yeah. you know, well, what do you mean by this? And it's like, well, what do you think I meant? Like, <laughs> and I'm not trying to be funny, but that does make sound, yeah. but yeah, make them is, interpret yeah, back what, what you yeah. think I'm saying, because a lot of times it's my, not my responsibility to make you understand how I'm really feeling per mm -hmm. se. You know, if you're the yeah. listener and it's not really clear what I'm saying, you need to ask more questions so you can be clear on what I'm saying. If you're not going to ask me for more clarification and you walk away with whatever understanding that you have, that's on you. Like text messaging. I don't like text mes messaging for a lot of things because it has no tone to oh, it. Yeah. And I don't know what you're saying. Some text messages like piss me off. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I have to pick up the phone. And first of all, if you know me, you know, I don't like texting. So don't, I'm not about to have no whole conversation mm -hmm. on no text message. So I'm just going to pick up the phone and call you after like one or two responses. I might give you two. Then I'm going to call you because I'm not getting ready to type all of this out. However, Tone is important. Body language is important. Mm -hmm. You know, all of that and keeping the lines of communication open. And I also never go to sleep with any aggression on my heart because if that person died and I have had a relative to die that I had words with. And it was so long ago, I don't even remember the significance of the argument, but I know we weren't speaking when she died. And it was probably something frivolous because I was in my early 20s, but that is um, a feeling that I never would want to feel again. So when I lay my bed down and head down in my bed at night, I make sure that I have made peace with myself and them. But if I can't make it with them, I at least want to be at peace with myself. Like, Hey, I'm sorry that they didn't truly understand where I was coming from, but I feel better. So if anybody have to not feel better after that conversation, I prefer it to be them instead of me, really nobody, mm -hmm. but you got to make sure you don't say or do anything that if that individual died, you wouldn't be okay with it. And that's how I set boundaries too. You know, like, Hey, and if I feel like I need to say what I need to say, I'm going to say it. I'm sorry it hurt your feelings, but I meant what I said, you know, and I'm sorry it hurt your feelings because I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but I'm not trying to walk around with mine suppressed or hurt either. So where's the happy medium? Constant communication. And that's where therapy comes in. If it's somebody that you really, really want to build a relationship or whatever, like a parent or whatever, it's okay to go to family therapy. Let's talk about it. One person don't just need it. It's a whole relationship that has to be cultivated because we don't know how to really be effective communicators in a lot of situations, right? We just shut down. Like, oh, just forget it. I don't feel like arguing, so just forget it. You know, all the other things, oh, I'll be out of here in a little while, so just forget it. You know, or whatever, and it's just not right. I think it's important 
to be able to express how you feel. And it's difficult for me now being married for 17 years and having someone that I can talk to about absolutely anything to someone who doesn't like to talk about anything. Sun up, sun down. That was yesterday. It's over with. I'm not like that. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it was yesterday. And I want to know why that happened yesterday. You know, or whatever. I'm not just moving on. So, you know, human beings are difficult individuals. But what I will say is you have to set those boundaries where you feel comfortable. And like I said, don't say or do anything that you would not be comfortable with if that person died. But also say what you need to say. You don't want to regret not saying something because they did either. You know, mm -hmm. so that's where you find that balance. Like, man, I wish I would have said this, good or bad. Now I never get an opportunity to express to them how I really feel. And I think it's okay. But I'm different. A lot of people can't handle the truth. We mask the truth in a myriad of ways in this world. We say stuff to make people feel good and comfortable. We don't necessarily say how we feel. We weren't. When you see a little kid that speaks their mind, what do they say to that kid? Be honest. They try to suppress it half of the time. They, mm -hmm. they try to suppress it half the time. Like, you so grown. Yeah. Oh, you let him say that. I get that from LJ all the time. Oh, he is so grown. He's saying too much or whatever. He's not trying to be rude or disrespectful. And maybe he is to other people. But guess what? He living in my house. And if I'm okay with what he's saying... I don't care what nobody else is getting ready to say about it. It does not matter. But the reason why I allow him that freedom of flexibility, because my voice was suppressed for so long that I didn't even talk about a molestation that happened to me. And I'm not going to raise him that way. Say what it is. And, and, that, and it is what it is, as they say. But say what it is. I don't want him walking around holding anything or being afraid to talk about stuff. I want him to be open and be able to say what it is that he wants to say. And I think the paradigm has to shift in this world. You know, and we can bring it up with Donald Trump. Nobody really liked him in this room, I don't think. But guess what? I respected him. Because I didn't have to figure out if he was a racist, if he was a bigot, if he was a pervert, yeah, or yeah. none of that. I respected him because he was honest. Mm -hmm. Whatever he wanted to say, he said it, and you knew how he was going to feel about it. Now, he ran a country like Suge Knight and Death Row Records, but you knew what he was thinking. From those tweets. I bet you he sleep good when he go to bed at night. I yeah. bet you he sleep real good when he get in the bed at night. I bet you that. So that's how it needs to be. How do you guys feel about setting boundaries for yourself? Do you think it would be some guilt associated with it? Um, personally, I think yes. But I think that's mostly because of how I was raised. So I think... Like, I feel guilty when I have feelings about something half of the time. So, like, if I'm feeling, like, somewhat, like, angry with a person or, like, disgruntled with somebody, I feel guilty that I'm feeling that way. And it's really weird when it comes to setting boundaries because I also feel like I'm not being as accessible to somebody. And it's also... It kind of feels like I'm being standoffish in mm -hmm. a way. But it's just that I... Something's not feeling right, and I don't feel comfortable, so I kind of just don't want to be around you in that way. So I kind of just step back. Even though I feel guilty, and it stays on my mind, it's just... It's really Two hard words. to do. Self-care. Take care of yourself. It sounds like you are a giver and you make people happy and you would extend yourself to the degree that it hurts you. If it helps them, you go for it, right? And I'm not saying anything is wrong with that, but it is gonna seem weird to somebody else who's not used to the new you. There's a transition that takes place in life. You were raised as a child. 
you know, to be a certain way with certain morals and values and stuff like that. And then you end up fighting against who you really are when you get older. So now this transition has to take place. Nobody's ready to accept who you're becoming because they're so used to who you were. They have to get to know you and get to love you and meet you where you're at. Now, sometimes meeting people where they are, you have to leave them there. You never, they can't come with you emotionally, physically, or any of that, and that's okay. But I don't think it's okay if you don't at least try to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And if they don't understand you, don't be frustrated. They just don't understand you, and it's a misunderstanding. But that's better than not saying anything at all and you carrying around all this anguish. If they don't understand you, fine. Do you understand you? Find yourself, find your happy place, and be at peace with yourself. Do the best you can to talk about who you are and who you've transformed into or what changed, because I'm always changing. So anybody in a relationship with me, I'm not going to be in the same place. And Tyler, you know, as your godmother, I don't stay in the same place the next year. I'm something different. I'm mm -hmm. moving different. I'm doing different. Air different. I'm constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. So I'm never going to be the same. And if you can't keep up with that fan, I'm not expecting you to, but I'm just asking you to respect how I'm moving. Respect how I'm living. Respect what I'm doing. Because when I take that last breath, you ain't jumping in the ground with me. No, I'm in there by myself and I'm not jumping in with you. I hope we can find a happy medium in a place where we can get along and have mutual respect for one another. Because I think with anger, trauma, aggression or whatever, you can lose respect for someone. But it's okay to have those feelings but still have respect for the person. And I think that that's what happens when we're misunderstood. We feel disrespected. And I think if people just let you know, I still love you and I still have respect for you. I just don't like that. People become standoffish because they are wounded or they are hurt, you know, um, and, and that's common. But, hey, if I really love you and you're my friend, then I'm going to say what I have to say. And you might not like it, but I'm going to call you tomorrow anyway because we're friends. That was another boundary because I just shut down like, ooh, well, they said that. I'm not calling them or whatever. But it's like, no, I'm going to still call you. You know, I had to eat that. You're right. Everything you said wasn't totally wrong. If that's your opinion, I have to accept it because how can I expect someone to meet me where I am and respect me and I'm not willing to do it for them? There's some reciprocity in that process. And if we agree to disagree, if we never overstand and we always understand, fine. But you got to be all right with who you are and where you are in life. And it's hard with a parent-child relationship because they're providing for you. So you feel like if you try to set boundaries or do something different for yourself that, you know, well, I'm taking care of you or I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And I had to have a conversation with my mom once I got grown. And it's not disrespecting anything that you've done for me. I'm just a different person. And I just want you to get to know who I am, who I really am. There's a difference between me as a child and me as a grown woman. I went over to her house one day and she was bossing me around. Hey, hey, <laughs> I'm grown, grown. Now, I don't mind helping, mm -hmm. but I'm grown, grown. Or I could have just let her boss me around and then left like, you know what? I ain't going over there no damn more because she always making me do work. I just had to be honest. Like, mom, I understand that I'm still your daughter or whatever, but I don't feel like doing that right now. So I just want to chill. She didn't stop. So guess what? Now, if I don't have that extra in me, I don't go visit her. Right, wrong, or indifferent? It doesn't matter. If I know I can't deal with these other things, or that she's going to supersize something, or I'm going to see something in the house that I don't agree with, or whatever it is, I just don't go over there because I'm maintaining my peace. I'm not mad. I'm not upset. I'm not disappointed. I'm not anything except for when I wake up in the morning, I'm in a good mood. And when I lay down at night, I want to still be in a good mood. I'm not going to let anybody take my peace away. And if I got to stay away from you, then that's what I'm going to do. 
And that's that. Any closing remarks from the High Low podcasters? Oh, we should Tyler try to do Kaya? the Rage Room, then come back to see how we feel about it. Yeah, we if should definitely works. try. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, then check it out. Try to do the Rage Room. Um, and then come back. I would want to throw an axe. We and, should, yeah. They also got one. Um, Canton got an axe throwing thing, the rage room and the escape room and everything. I have a such a bad shoulder, though, that I don't know if I could throw an axe. But if you feel like you're just cracking somebody's head in the rage room, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but we will find out. Any parting words for you, Kaya? Not, nope. <laughs> you? Any parting parting words for you, Tyler? Uh, like I usually say, if I say something ignorant, excuse me, and keep on trying. Never that. I would never think that you say anything ignorant because on a black coffee, no sugar, no cream, we do it black, strong, and unfiltered. So it wouldn't be ignorant, but I think he's saying if he said something um, that was offensive, he wasn't trying to be offensive, mm -hmm. but he was trying to be real. And on that note, exactly. we are ending the first <laughs> segment of the real black coffee, no sugar, no cream, where we don't try to spill the tea or make you feel dazed like you had a shot of sheep liquor. We just want you to see things from a different perspective. Mine. We'll see you in a few. WGPR Detroit HD2. You're watching WHPS, Highland Park, Detroit. FM 88.1 WHPR, Highland Park. WVIE 107.3 FM Charlotte, Amalia, Virgin Islands. Oh, the 
this is me So hear my plea I'm a young black man Down on my knees I say this world is wrong And we don't have too long I'm gonna take this stand As a strong black man You are listening to The Real Black Coffee, No Sugar, No Cream, 107.5 HD, 88.1 FM, and 107.3 WVIE in the Virgin Islands. You know, I get real excited when I talk about my hometown. And tonight, I have two members of the Project We Hope, Dream, and Believe team in the studio. So, Janisha, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us again. Um, my name is Janisha Washington. I'm the co-founder of Project We Hope, Dream, Believe, and... I'm here with my partner in crime, Mr. Sims. Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Sims. I'm the other half or the other co-founder of Project We Hope, Dream, and Believe, and I serve as the executive director. So tell us how this organization began. Uh, it, just, it just came about, um, I think at the time I was serving as the president of the uh, NAACP of Western Wayne County. And um, I think I had called Miss Washington on the phone and I said, man, like we need to do something because like the youth is being forgot about. Mm -hmm. And she started putting her mind together. And I think for like a whole week, we were shooting the name of an organization like back to back and forth again. So we came up with, uh, I don't even know how, but we was like, project we hope dream and believe and we was like that's it bam that's it <laughs> that's it and that's it. so it's uh i don't know it's like a, a a name that was just like catchy for us and from that point forward we just came up with our mission statement and, and moved it forward when i heard of the organization it was from miss washington because um she had a program for girls yeah. that right. were in residential care, mm -hmm. and she was providing some services to those young ladies. Then the next thing I knew, you blew up. Like, you were on the news, and it was like, <laughs> what is this? Like, I just interviewed those two on my show, and they just blew up. It was about saving the home on Williams Street yeah. Yeah. where Malcolm X used to live. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so another phone call, right? So Aaron is the one that's the, you know, he comes with these ideas and I'm just kind of like, okay, how, you know, how you want me to fit in with this, right? 
Um, so Aaron called me and he said, look, so I've been doing some research and he was so excited. So if anybody knows Aaron, when Aaron gets excited about something, you can, you gotta, you know, like you gotta bring him back down. Come on back down, Aaron, so I can understand <laughs> what you're saying. So he said, you know, this, this opportunity has presented itself. You know, I've been doing my research. Malcolm X used to stay in this house and it's on the list to be torn down. Right. So I said, okay, well, what, what's your thought process? And he said, let me go to work and I'll get back with you. Kid you not, like two days later, he called me back. He said, okay, we gonna, we, we about to buy this house. Right. And then we need to try our best to save this house because everybody was coming to him. No, he didn't stay there, you know, and he was getting torn down during the process. And I kept telling him, I kept being that voice of reasoning. You know, it's always hard for people to believe something that they never heard of. Right. So those are your naysayers. Just keep pushing, keep finding the research. We going to make it work. Right. So he kept pushing, he kept finding the research and we ended up securing the home. Um, the city of Inkster assisted us with that at the time. We got the house and we started finding all of the paperwork to support everything that Aaron had been saying for years. Um, through this process, he was torn down. He was made fun of. Um, people were telling him, you know, man, you ain't gonna be able to do nothing with that house. Look at it. It's all dilapidated. It's this, it's that. But it's something about having a supportive team that'll keep you focused, right? So... Our team gathered around and we like, look, keep pushing, keep pushing, right? So not only has our organization secured over $380,000 in the federal grant to restore this home, we went in front of the National Historic Board of Michigan. The house is now deemed as historic. And we have um, Ambassador Shabazz on our team supporting us. I mean, it's just amazing to have her in our board meetings, like just encouraging us, right? Just to stay positive. And it, it kind of, I never get starstruck, me personally, because I'm like, you know, you human just like me. But it, it, it was a special feeling, right? To have his daughter sit and tell us she was proud of us, that she supported what we were doing. She had been watching Aaron. She had built a rapport with Aaron. She trusted Aaron. And because of that trust, she was now trusting all of us to keep that legacy going. But then what was most important to her was not to leave out his brother and his wife. Because everybody keeps saying, that's Malcolm X house, that's Malcolm X house. But he lived there with his brother and his wife. Wolford, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So she said, look, I don't care how y'all bring up the party. Y'all can make all these fat, you know, wonderful things going on. But please always pay homage to my uncle and his wife. That's her one ask. And we have literally made sure we adhere to that. So we're happy that everybody's getting it to, you know, be known as Malcolm X house, but we want to, we're going to try to change the narrative a little bit because we want to honor her and we want his kids that are still alive to, you know, have their parents recognized, you know, because it's not just one. It was his family that was supporting him in that effort. So, so it was Wolford Little's house. Wolford and Ruth Little. Yes. Okay. Wolford and Ruth Little's house. Yes, ma'am. And Malcolm X mm. lived there. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Wow. I'm proud of you because I know you endured a lot of naysayers, people not really believing in your dream what you hoped, dreamed, and, and believed believe. in. Yes, ma'am. However, you mentioned your team a couple of times. So can you tell me who else is a part of your team? Yes, ma'am. So um, we have our, our team consists of Dewan Lynn, um, who is also the co-project manager for this entire project. So you may have seen him on a lot of the press release. We have um, Dr. Tariq Ramon. He's also um, our project lead, but also our grant writer. He was actually one of the writers that helped, in, in addition to Aaron, find the grant for um, the housing. So, uh, and Dr. Tarek works at Wayne State, Wayne State University. Right. He's also heading off the uh, ar archaeological uh, search that will occur in spring. Springtime. Spring. So we're actually going to have an archaeological uh, event 
where, you know, they're going to dig and see if they can find any artifacts and we're going to do a whole program with that. So hopefully I have enough time to tell you about that later. But um, so we have Dr. Tarek, we have Dewan Lynn, myself, Aaron, um, my husband, Willie Washington, um, Carrie Hill, mm -hmm. Arthur Edge, um, and Priscilla and Miss Gloria. Gloria, Gloria Williams and Priscilla, Priscilla Huddleston. So that is our team. That's the dynamic team that's behind the scenes. Um, you really won't see too many of us out in the forefront. It's probably going to either be Aaron, me, Dewan, or uh, Tarek. Everybody else is camera shy, if you will. <laughs> and they like to be behind the scenes. Uh, Mr. Arthur, he is our head contractor for, this, for the um, renovation of the home. So he's going to be in the front trying to make sure everyone that we deal with as far as the the rehabilitation of the home we have legit you know contractors and people that are passionate about what we're doing so before we get into the archaeology I heard that it was a a wall inside of the house that still has to sit on it from where the house was firebombed is that mm -hmm. true right so so what it was was uh, a homeless guy had uh, lived in the house, and he built a, a campfire um, in the house. And the campfire just got, like, out of hand, and it it burnt the, uh, like, the living room wall up to the roof. But it's, it's like, it's not no, no real bad damage, um, but, you know, we're, we're going to replace all that. And then another good thing about it is, is that the house still has the original bathtub um, in the house. So if you ever, if you ever read uh, Malcolm X's book, um, he talks about uh, when he came there, how uh, when he started to uh, start Islam, like getting to Islam, how he would pray and wash his feet and stuff. So that same bathtub still exists in that house today. Wow, that's really amazing. Um, I want to give a shout out to Inkster's own Robert Turley, too, because I went on the tour, you know, mm -hmm. when we had the all class reunion this year and the information and knowledge that he shared about our city as a whole, right. but especially about the house is amazing. So let's talk about the archaeology. What do they think is back there? Some dead bodies or something? What are they on there? <laughs> <laughs> like, wait so, a minute, ain't nobody looking for no bones right. on William Street. I hope not, right? But, um, yes, and you were right. Um, my apologies. Let's definitely shout out Robert. Um, he is amazing. And he's actually, once the house is done, we're going to incorporate, a, we're going to work a lot with him to make sure that when he does the tours in Inkster that that home is one of his stops, you know. So thank you, Robert, for being, you know, um, instrumental in this process, but the archaeological part, um, I guess, and I'm, and I, again, this is more of Tariq's part, right? So, um, what they're going to do is they're going to do some digging around the parameter of the home. Um, they have students that are going to school for archaeology and um, some actual archaeological people that have been through school, completed, and everything, overseeing the whole entire project. And they will dig to see if they can find anything within that time frame um, of him living there that may be relevant to us, you know, when we restore the home as a museum, kind of, sort of. So I'm interested to see. I don't want to see no bones, but I do want to <laughs> see if they have, like, you know, maybe some car keys, you know, old wallet or something. That would be interesting to see. Interesting to see. So... It's going to be interesting. And then the, um, we all thought that it would be very um, hands-on to have, because we had children from Robichaud help with the um, outdoor cleanup before. Um, and we want to kind of incorporate that again, have some surrounding schools that our Inkster kids go to, um, especially our high school students, have them participate in that event. You know, um, of course, we want to adhere to COVID restrictions and things like that. It may only go three or four days. So what we're thinking is um, for Black History Month, we'll have them write something, you know, um, something other than what they know, right, that they can go Google about Malcolm X, you know, have them do maybe a speech or something or a essay to say what, what you didn't know about Malcolm X, but what you now know. 
and how does that play a role in, you know, do you want to continue to know more about him, you know, or do you know all that you need to know about him? And then we'll select the children from that standpoint to participate. So kind of switch it up because, you know, Black History Month, they always do the normal uh, African-American people that they can Google and they don't really go into depth about what they learn about them. So we want to switch the game up a little bit. I understand. Anything you want to add about the archaeology, Aaron? Uh, Miss Washington summed it all up. See? You know, I take my hat off to both of you for preserving that legacy because that could have just been something that we read about and moved on. Mm -hmm. But to preserve it to the degree of restoration is a wonderful thing. And that brings about my next topic of legacies. Mm -hmm. Because I truly feel like a lot of my family legacy dwindled when my grandparents died. Mm -hmm. And perhaps yours, because I know you come from a very big family, mm -hmm. the bishops and all of them. Things are not the same no, ma'am. <laughs> with Big Mama being gone. Preservation of our history and our legacy is not something that America, A-M-E-R-I-K-K-K-A, is into. Mm -hmm. They don't want their children reading about it in history books. I think it's a fear of learning that your family surname is attached to some lynch mob or some huge plantation somewhere. I don't understand. And then a lot of people say, well, black history is American history. Okay, well, let it be told then. Mm -hmm. Our way, mm -hmm. our version. So it's so important to preserve legacies. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that you got that historical designation. And does that mean they're going to bring out a historical marker and yeah, everything? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We're in the process. So, we're, we're, we'll, so start, starting in the spring, um, we actually have uh, a long list of things that we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to be doing the archaeology dig. Um, we're going to be doing the construction on the house um, around August. August, we're planning a black tire fair um, because we've purchased. So it's it's five lots that surround the house. So we purchased all five lots um, on the block. So so is it a couple behind? Because I've been there and it don't. They must no, be. Are they so, small? No. So it's it's two lots to the to the right of the house. Uh huh. So we, we bought the two lots directly next to the house. Going towards the corner. Going towards mm -hmm. Lehigh. Okay. So that's where we're, uh, our black tie affair is going to be um, the funds to start. What we want to do is put a, a like a, a well, we, got two th we got two ideas. So two we want to do the community garden and then we also want to have a community center like okay. built for the kids to have because we have a few universities mm -hmm. i don't want to name them because you know how that goes mm -hmm. but we have a few universities that want to partner with us to provide after school resources for those children um whether it be math reading ela whatever but have those resources there right um and then also have opportunities for people to come in and you know maybe they want to do a f financial literacy uh event they want to learn more about that they need resources you know they may have a shut off notice coming we want to be a, a, a everything that everyone needs kind of and because that's what he you know that's what Michael Max was right he provided resources to the African American community so and and again to our minorities so that's what that center is hopefully going to be for for them to come and get the resources that they need um and then on the other side like I said Aaron wants to do no. the um community garden and then he wants to do um kind of I, I well I forgot the term that you use but he wants to have a lot of inkster mem memorabilia um, oh, yeah, all of the, uh, we want to store all of like, uh, the Inkster historical, uh, like a museum, right. Parts to it as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we were thinking probably like in the community center, yep. um, we will have it like, like placed on the wall and stuff like that because all of Inkster's history now 
is sitting in a, a, a individual's garage right now when they tore the high school down. So all of the history is just sitting there. So we kind of want to, that's, that's our whole purpose for our black tie affair is to make it an annual as we write grants to build the community center, you know, to help fund the community center. And also along with our project, um, when it comes to the construction next, next year, you know, we're going to be doing the, uh, the open bidding for like Inkster individuals to come in to help restore the house. Right. So like black minority people could come, uh, if you own a business, uh, you know, whatever, but just to be, just to, just to let it be known, our construction team is, is real, real, real picky. So, you know, don't have your paperwork together. <laughs> have your exactly. paperwork <laughs> together. <laughs> all of that. Uh, don't come in thinking you're going to do what you want to do. Uh, you just, you just got to understand the assignment, you know? Uh, don't come in there like, oh, yeah, I can lay all this down. No, you just understand the assignment mm -hmm. and, and fall in line because we want to make sure that with this grant money, we allow people to eat off of, you know, to be able to profit from it. You know, Circulate our, our dollars in our community. community. Absolutely. And, and, and mm -hmm. I think that, you know, um, a lot of people, you know, think, They've been seeing us on the news, right? They've been seeing Aaron. They've been seeing Tariq. They've been seeing Dewan, And they're all like, okay, yeah, you know, what's going on with the house? And it's like, okay, um, word of mouth is something powerful. And I think that our Inkster people, even our surrounding cities, need to come together and support us in this, you know, um, because every little thing counts, you know, um, we all played the game of telephone when we were kids. You know, if somebody say something, by the time it gets to the other person, it's something completely different than what was being said at the mm -hmm. beginning. So I think it's it very important for people to understand that this process is going to take time. It took us years to get a grant. You know, it took us years for people to stop being naysayers for everything that Aaron had to say. Um, it took us a while to get the core team that we have. For, for the longest, it was just Aaron, mm -hmm. myself, and my husband. So, you know, you've been there with me when I, you know, and mm -hmm. Carrie, Carrie, we was, it was just us, you know, doing all the programs and stuff. You know, even when we had our back to school event, when we initially started out, what, six years ago, mm -hmm. it's just a skeleton crew, you know? So you're only as power as, as um, powerful as a support system that you have. And sometimes, you know, that's why I want to make people be like, okay, um, you see individuals post negative things, stop it. You don't have to share that. You don't have to comment to that. You know what I'm saying? If you, you know who Aaron is, you know who I am, I might not post all the time on my social media about it, but I, inbox me. Ask us, you know? Ask our Inkster natives, the, the real ones that's going to be honest with you. They can inbox you and ask. Mm -hmm. you, you will tell them the truth. You know what I'm saying? I just think that people need to, don't be so quick to jump to conclusions. You know, because um, this is a representation of all of us. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> we don't know how to stick together. The slave mentality from the years of slavery still exists today with your house Negroes mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, um, and, and the list goes on. Yes, ma'am. So, unfortunately, um, the process that you have used to get where you are, continue it. The two or three that's gathered together, mm -hmm. so is he, and move on. Yes, ma'am. You know, um, I'm back home working now, and I understand what you're saying. You know, with the harm reduction program, why are you passing out needles to people? Because they need them. Mm -hmm. They die. We wouldn't see needles on the ground. We wouldn't see syringe litter on the ground if it wasn't decriminalization. Mm -hmm. We got to get them. Just because they want to get high don't mean they should die. Exactly. So, yeah, we're at the Allen store every week asking them, hey, you good? You need clean supplies? You need to see a doctor? You need mental health services? Mm -hmm. We're not just passing out the needles and running. We're communicating with them. Mm -hmm. We're asking them, what do you need and what's going on? And, and we get a lot of pushback. And it would be easy for me to throw up my hands. I don't live in the city no more. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the first thing people want to say. Well, you ain't from here or you don't live here. We need everybody. We need a collective. Yes, ma'am. 
I don't care where you live. If you want to take directions, you see the vision, and you want to help it grow, come on in. Yes. So with that being said, how can people get in touch with you? If they want to volunteer, if they want to make a donation, if they want to help out. So, so we do have a website. Mm -hmm. um, and the website is www.pwhdab.org. And yes. uh, just real quick before Ms. Washington, uh, one, one thing I wanted to say about, about how, how your team works. Um, one thing that we did, because, like, we have to report to the grant people about everything that we're doing to the house. Oh, yeah. Um, so we, we had, uh, I think we had sent her an email and was like, hey, uh, this is what we're doing. And she emailed us back. She was like, uh, I don't know if you guys could do that. So what we're doing is we're taking everybody on a journey. Mm -hmm. uh, what did we call it? We called it the, uh, the reconstruction journey mm -hmm. of the house. Mm -hmm. So it'll be like every little thing that we do at the house is going to be like our own documentary. Right. And uh, I think she emailed us back. She was like, okay, you guys are too creative for me. Like, I got with the board, and they was like, no one has ever asked that question before. No one has ever thought to do, like, a, a digital documentary on their website right. of rehabbing a house. So, because we told her, we say, well, what if somebody's, like, in, in Africa, and they heard about the house? And we was like, well, they could go to the website and just click on it. And just see like the whole process from start, from to, start finish. to finish. She was like, y'all gone for y'all bad So She was like, approved, oh. budget approved. <laughs> right. And I forgot to mention too, and I apologize. If you're watching Shaka, please don't be mad at me. Shaka is also on our team. She is our web oh, developer yeah. Yeah. and um, she is amazing. Um, so uh, with that being said... They can go look this up on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, Project We Hold Dream Believe. Um, they can go on the website. We have a Google Doc out there if they want to volunteer. They can fill out the document. It goes straight to our secretary's email. And then she's keeping all of that information. And she will follow up with them once we get the, you know, all of our dates and stuff like that. For right now, because we are in winter. And we live in Michigan, right? So right now we ain't got no snow. But tomorrow we might have six feet. I ain't saying I want it. But I'm just saying that's how we, <laughs> you know. So um, we're going to hold tight on our... Uh, to do right now the house is just secured we have done cleanup around the home i don't know how recently you've been out there um, this summer with the tour I yeah and it, it's been changes since then wow yeah yeah you, it's totally different it's to we we had uh gartrell woods he's our landscaper uh they came over they cut all the trees down got all the debris from around the house and when I tell you it's different, it is totally different. Well, I'm out there often, so I'm going to Go and do by. a little drive-by. Yeah. You text me and let me know what you think. <laughs> I'm going to um, <laughs> drive by and check it out. I think those are um, amazing things. That documentary, I, I believe, it's going to change a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. What I am hoping is that it changes the perception to let people know Anything is possible. Mm -hmm. And we're more powerful together. Absolutely. We're going to have a few people, whether they're in key um, stakeholder positions or just the average person on the block mm -hmm. that don't believe in what it is that you're doing. But it doesn't matter. It just takes that two or three perseverance and consistency. Mm -hmm. Because I remember watching you go into the city. You and Dewan, you were consistent. And I happened to catch the meeting on the day that it was granted, that mm -hmm. you were given the house. Mm -hmm. Consistency. You were persistent. You really wanted it. And you stuck with it over time. Yes, ma'am. Yep. And he did. That's why. And it was so funny because I remember... Me and him have a lot of conversations, you know, where he, when he needs me to be the person to push him that extra push, right, he called me. 
and he'll say, Mrs. Washington, I already know what you're about to say. I already know, you know. But my thing is, like I told him, this is your baby. This is my baby too, don't get me wrong. You know, we in this together, but this is his baby. I've sat and watched him fight for this, right? So it's only right for me to be the man behind the curtain helping him. You know what I'm saying? This is your moment. So when, when he gets those press conferences or he gets that opportunity to speak, you can see how he's just like glowing. I did see it. I tuned in. Yeah. I wanted to come there and be on site like this. <laughs> <My dog. laughs> he is amazing. But Aaron is I was amazing. so happy. And I would like to volunteer Black Coffee to um, be your MC or host at Absolutely. your black tie or anything that you need black coffee to do if you need soar you know as far as youth programming we're in the envision center right now around the corner every wednesday okay, okay. doing programming with the kids they come you know and we give them books life skills programming and stuff like that mm -hmm. so we're there and we definitely um, are um one of the things that aaron and the other gentlemen on our board have talked about you know they're like y'all got the girls mentoring program we need to do our thing so they I, i'm challenging them and i'm gonna say it publicly on your show that 2022 they need to figure out what they're gonna do for these young men they need to figure out a game plan i don't care if y'all take them fishing but y'all better do something with these young men in 2022 so i'm gonna say that here and i'm gonna say it again on facebook I, but all i can say is yes ma'am <laughs> you know and it's gonna happen oda dan was on the show um last week and we talked about Black Man Hill. Mm -hmm. And we're getting ready to do a documentary with him to talk about his life. You know, um, it's probably going to be called I'm So Ink Town because he has a song out mm -hmm. called I'm So Ink Town. But for him to bear all about who he was growing up and what happened or whatever, we need more of that. It's a lot of young people that look up to him in mm -hmm. the rap community and in that sector or whatever. And... To see where he is at now after that life altering experience getting mm. hit by that truck. He said that changed his life. He had to deal with depression and anxiety and he had no problem talking about it. Mm -hmm. And so we just need our black men to heal. Absolutely. And mental health is real. And so they can come back and deal with our youth yep. <laughs> in the right way. Mm -hmm. I agree. And let them know that it's okay not to be okay, but you are loved. You are not forgotten. We are here. Absolutely. And I think all they really want to know is someone's there for them. They do. That someone is there for them. You know, I really hope, and I'm putting this out there, and I know I'm probably going to get a lot of pushback, and Mr. Simmons was really, really a great English teacher when I was in Inkster High School, but we need to name that building back the Malcolm X Center and not the Floyd Simmons Center. It was always the Malcolm X. I don't know who decided that it needed to be something else. And even if it's not the whole building, maybe a certain annex. Or a room or something. A room yeah. or something. But his name needs to go back on that building. I took karate lessons at the Malcolm X. We didn't mm -hmm. have an Inkster complex at first. I, that didn't come about till like I was in high school or whatever. Mm -hmm. When I was a young kid, I came from across Michigan Avenue to the Malcolm X for my activities. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you probably don't remember, but it was a set of twins, Tanya and Mignon. And one of them was a karate teacher. So it wouldn't hurt to name a room or part of the annex or the gym or whatever. And I don't know why they changed the name from the Malcolm X. Do you, you know? know that it was um, called, okay. was it called the Malcolm X Center yep. because he the lived Malcolm. in Inkster? Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Okay, well. But I want to go back to what you were saying about, um, you know, keeping our generation, you know, like keeping it going, right? Um, and it's funny that you mentioned that because we had that, me and Aaron had that same conversation. Starting this nonprofit, being involved in the community, reaching back to our youth. Um, what do we want to leave? You know, when, when, when I'm gone, what am I leaving for my kids besides life insurance, property? You know, I need something that can help them continue to push forward, right? Um, 
when my girls were small, and I don't know if, I, I know you guys probably know this TV show, but remember Pinky and the Brain, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody knows what they used to say at the beginning of the show. They used to say, um, what are we going to do today, Pinky? And he take said the same the thing that we do every day. And he said, well, what is that? We say we take over the world, right? So I switched it up. And I used to say to my girls when I dropped them off at school, what are we going to do today, girls? They said the same thing we do every day. I said, well, what is that? We're going to find a way to change the world. And I said that to them to, since they were small, all the way up until my baby girl, that, my oldest, that just graduated this past June. It's on you. You, you got to find a way to change it. You can't sit and complain about what's going on in the community if you ain't willing to change it. So that is what we're trying to do. And that's why if anything, if I don't do nothing else, I want my girls and my son our family to be proud to say not only was she someone that was active in the community she was involved with the restoration of the Malcolm X I'm sorry the Wilfer and Malcolm X home um, and she helped the youth you know and those are things that you want to be known for so I guess the real question is what do you want to be known for when you leave the earth right what do you want your family to remember you as and I think once people really start asking themselves that tough question then they'll change how they currently live their lives. You know, um, as you were talking, I, I don't know why I was envisioning all of the young kids in the street and just um, dying, you know, from day to day. What are you known for at that moment? I, and, and I believe that's because we took ourselves out of that equation. Yep. We, we, we removed ourselves from that. Um, piggybacking off of like the legacy, like your legacy. Uh, I was telling the young man the other day, I said, man, I said, I used to sit there and wonder, like, when my daddy used to go to work, he used to get his drawn out speech before he walked out the door. <laughs> Look, don't y'all get out there and mess up our name. I was like, why do he keep saying this? Like, this is like his number one thing, like, when y'all out in them streets, don't y'all mess up this last name. Mm -hmm. So then it, it kind of dawned on me, and I said, it's their legacy. Mm -hmm. So when I started understanding it, I was like, okay, well, my Uncle Johnny started the softball league in Inkster, and he ran the Splits baseball team. So, like, everybody knew our family from playing, like, baseball in Inkster. And all these people just started joining, joining. Um, I, and I told him, I said, so I said, one day I went to the Harrison store and I said, this guy looked at me and said, you look familiar. And I told him who my family was. He said, man, he said, look, when your uncle got killed the Lamont guards, he said, it drove me back to doing drugs. He said, and I'm going to tell you why. He said, because I was across Michigan Avenue going into the uh, drug house he say your uncle pulled up on the side of me and was like i bet not catch you going back into that house again you better be over at that baseball field ready to play baseball he said i looked at that man like this man i lost his mind telling me what to do he said about two days later i go into the drug house and he said just as i got ready to start using the drug he said this guy kicked the door in and walked in like he owned the place. He said, man, that joker grabbed me and drug me outside and beat me up and said, didn't I tell you not to show up in here? I told you to meet me at the baseball field. He said, you better be at the baseball field by 3.30. So I say, so what did you do? He said, shoot, I was at the baseball field at 145. <laughs> I know, that's right. <laughs> he said, he say, man, and he said, he said, man, he said, just playing baseball with your uncle, it changed my life. He just felt like somebody cared yep. about mm -hmm. him. He was yeah. probably in there self-medicating, masking pain from mm -hmm. abandonment and anything else and feeling like nobody cared yep. about him. Yep, I agree. Yep. So that's a wonderful thing, and we need more of that. And people may not agree with the methodology or whatever, but, you know, Malcolm X said, by any means by any necessary. Means so if you got to kick the dough in and drag them out, mm -hmm. then so be it. Yeah. But we need more of that in our great city of Inkster. You know, I went to two 
all class reunion events. I, I went saw to you. the one at Inkster High on the former grounds of mm -hmm. our school and then the back in the day cabaret. Mm -hmm. That's true Inkster love, not what the white mainstream media mm -hmm. chooses to portray not just Inkster, but any predominantly black city ass, because that's what keeps your news media outlet working. We mm -hmm. need more black media outlets. It's more going on in our communities than killing. Yes, we have our share and we all own it. But true Inkster love, old school love, those things went off without incident. Mm -hmm. When you have your Inktown Writers event, <laughs> They go off without incident. They do. And people will see you coming in, you know, y'all on trues and, you know, hydraulics and all the mm -hmm. old schools or whatever that society was stigmatized as a bunch of dope dealers or something with these cars mm -hmm. or whatever when you just homeboys with toys. And, and, and they've done so much. And they've yet just, and, yeah. And yet and still, this past Saturday, the, the Ink Town Rider Car Club, uh, barbecue and uh and made dinners for the fire department and the police station and then before that you guys did a candy drive for the kids on mm -hmm. halloween on the, in the on michigan and Insta road mm -hmm. so i mean why not that's the question mm -hmm. why not have more of our men that you want to say are drug dealers or whatever the case may be let the show that positivity you yeah. know what i'm saying show yeah, that they're those stereotypes exactly uh next week we have uh you know just doing the car thing we have also have it where we connect it with a uh a, a auto shop and so we take a group of kids to the auto mm -hmm. shop I read that. to let them see like hands like on. hands on because like some of us we have like cars that's old school but they they move faster than your normal car with these big motors in it. So now these kids are going in there like, oh, man, that's a a 68 GTO uh, with a LS motor swap in it. Like, oh, so now they understanding like all this stuff. They learning how to break the motor down, change the oil, and they loving it. And they yeah, loving I've it. learned a lot because my gentleman has an 85 Monte Carlo SS with a 383 stroker yep. with nitrous. Yep, yep, yep. See? <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. He, ain't, he ain't for no game. Right. Yeah. So I learned about it because, you know, um, speaking of our black men taking a lead, black women, we have to chill sometime. Mm -hmm. Do I have leadership abilities? Yes. Do I bring a lot to the table? Yes, but I don't want to bring the table. Mm. Amen. Can you say that part right. one more time? <laughs> exactly. I bring a lot to the table, but I don't want to bring the table. Yeah. Mm. I want a black man to lead me. Mm -hmm. But the right black man got to lead The right me, one. Yeah, the, the right. gentleman that's, that knows exactly <laughs> what he's doing right. or whatever. Exactly. But we need that. And it's a lot of reasons why the black man started taking a back seat in the home. And it began with slavery. Mm. Yes. You know, stepping back, how are you going to watch somebody else rape your wife? Mm -hmm. You know, and then you got to be out of the home. And then when we move towards the depression, that scene from Claudine always sticks in my mind. You can't even have an iron in a home, a decent rug, or a black man to receive any mm -hmm. benefits or help. Where the other people were getting subsidies and everything from the government through the mm -hmm. Great Depression. So it's a lot of reasons why our men took the back seat and our women had to take the front seat. But I'm telling you. That paradigm needs to shift. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I had to learn. My mother was a strong black woman. Our dad was out of the home. When I was in third grade, my mother did everything. I could put drywall up, all of that, cut grass, all of that. But I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I have to catch myself. Even Superman need a break. Exactly. I'm just saying. But I have to catch myself. I start doing everything on my own, and my role is just kind of like, um, I can get that. I can too. But it's like, okay, mm -hmm. no, you know, go ahead and get it. Mm -hmm. I have to reprogram my way of thinking because for so long I have been doing things myself. Yeah. So I appreciate what project we hope, dream, and believe has brought back to the great city of Inkster. And I hope to hear more about the project. You know I love you both tremendously. We and you're you welcome too. to come back here 
anytime. Yes, anytime you want to use this platform or if you just want to jump on a live and give an update or whatever, you are more than welcome to do that. And hopefully you can come back in certain intervals. I would love to come film on location sometimes with Absolutely. you and interview no you there um, and, and capture some things there. Just thank you for never giving up. Your perseverance I know there's so much more to come from you two and the organizations that you have involvement with, but if nobody gets anything else from this broadcast, consistency and perseverance. And don't be afraid to stand alone because sometimes that's what you gotta do. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Nobody's gonna have your back all the time. Don't be afraid to stand alone and stand up for what you believe in. Are there any parting words that either of you would like to have? Tanisha? I just want to say thank you um, for having us. You know, it, it always feels like we're just sitting on the couch having a conversation amongst <laughs> ourselves. Um, and it just happened to be a microphone somewhere around, you know. But um, thank you for supporting us over the years. You know, it, it speaks volumes, right? Um, thank you for coming and helping us when we were doing our girls mentoring program. Or just being a voice of reasoning for us. It, it means a lot, right? Um, and we are tremendously happy to see those that have been supporting us since day one you know still commenting you know or sharing or inboxing like hey we seen you on the news mm -hmm. or hey we seen this you know it's a good feeling so I just want to say thank you to those people that are truly supportive of us that is keeping uh, the positive narr narrative going we truly support you um, and it is more to come and I look forward to our Inkster natives and surrounding areas to embrace us and support us um, now more than ever. So um, thank you again. That's all I got to say. Aaron? Uh, I'm just humble. <laughs> I'm humble. That's all I got to say. I'm, she said it all. <laughs> and you always have been. So mm -hmm. for those that's listening and you're wondering why you're getting these little one-liners or whatever, that's just how he that's is. Him. That's him. Just humble. And it's so funny because when the news come, he'd be like, you coming? No, I'm not coming. You, you only seen me on one news broadcast about this house. And that was in February. It was cold. cold. Other than that, I'm pushing Aaron. It's a wonderful thing. And see, you heard her say, nope, I'm not coming. I'm pushing him. So black men, we will get behind you. Do the right thing. Amen. Yes, ma'am. We will get behind you. We won't let you fall. We're going to push you. Well, you have listened to the second segment of The Real Black Coffee, No Sugar, No Cream on 107.5 HD Radio, 88.1 FM and 107.3 WVIE in the Virgin Islands. This is not a show where I try to spill any tea or make you feel dazed like you drank a shot of cheap liquor. I just want you to see things from a different perspective. Mine. Have a wonderful week. A great Thanksgiving, and we will see you next week. So long.